Stop Ruining My Childhood podcast. A sometimes nostalgic, sometimes cynical look back at pop culture. Join us as we revisit cartoons, movies, and live action TV of the 80s and 90s and ask the question, Does this hold up? Or did I just ruin my childhood? My name is Megan. And I'm Steve. And today we are reviewing Flight of the Navigator, which you can find on Disney+. Plus. Nor- now, normally we jump right into our non-sponsored snack review, but first you have a listener question. Yeah, so somebody asked us um, how we choose the things that we watch because Flight of the Navigator in particular was a fan request so right now we're in the middle of a cycle so we do a cartoon and then a live action tv and then a movie right so we did transformers and then greatest american hero and now we're doing flight of the navigator and then we're starting again next week with gem which is our cartoon choice and we're we have a segment at the end called what is steve willing to watch and i have some descriptions of some episodes of gem so stay tuned for that kind of sneak peek at the end but basically it's a little bit of a mixed process i would say would you say that steve? yes yeah i would say so so we when we came up with the idea for the podcast we made a really long list like an extensive list we made a really long list to start with of all, all the shows and movies and tv that just popped into our head from our childhood yeah. to kind of start with. And then we started trying to s- sort of selecting from there. Right. So once we had that list and we put everything in one of those three categories, it, it's kind of a mixture from there between what we feel like watching <laughs> on any given week and sometimes to what we can find. There have been a number of things like kind of forgotten 80s, especially not so much 90s once DVDs were created but especially the some of the stuff from the 80s that we have not been able to find so that's why there are a few things like muppet babies we did a few weeks ago yep alvin and the chipmunks that are on youtube but that's really kind of the only place you can find them and we didn't want to do something like um vr5 is a good example it's a sci-fi show that ran for like a season in the 90s right that's only on dvd i kind of don't want to do that because we want people to be able to watch along with us. Right. And kind of enjoy these things. So if we can find things like we were able to find Manimal on YouTube. We were, yes. But it took a lot of digging. Um, we also tried to, I think especially probably more with the cartoons, Steve, would you say that a lot of those are really gendered? Like there are some like Transformers is really aimed at boys. Muppet Babies was kind of for both, but Gem really more aimed at girls. Yes. So we kind of, with those, have tried to balance it out. And with the live action TV, you know, we kind of did the same where um, there's some stuff like I really remember or Steve really remembers. And also between things that are well known and things that are a little bit less well known. Yeah, we tried to mix it up a little bit. Right, like we did Little House on the Prairie ran for nine seasons. A Team was one of the top five shows when it ran. And right. then Manimal had eight episodes. Eight episodes, exactly. <laughs> um, so some things kind of like that. Um, it is a little bit of a mixed bag, but we are open to listener suggestions. And I will say this too, summer is coming up and we're going to kind of theme some things for the summer, which I think we talked about in our last podcast. Yeah, we may have, yeah. So, thank you so much for the question. And I will also say our Muppet Babies episode just ran. So we we record a couple ahead where we had another person ask if we were doing okay from COVID. (laughs) So by now, um, you can kind of hear still a little bit of residual stuffiness, kind of like a cold. But yes, we're doing quite well. So thank you so much for asking. So let's get into... So our non-sponsored childhood flashback snack this week is the sugar daddy i have been looking forward to this for several weeks the milk caramel pop the milk caramel pop okay so you taste yours yeah steve bit into his just before we started recording don't don't shame me (laughs) don't pop shame me i have some fun facts first about caramel now i will say that um Some people said that the Arabs first discovered caramel around 1000 AD. I have no idea if that's correct. I did not have access to my library school databases this week. Okay. This is a fact that's on Wikipedia and repeated in almost every... Like, if you look up history of caramel, there are a bunch of people who sell caramels. 
and they'll have a little history and it's clear that they've also gone to Wikipedia. Okay. (laughs) But it seems that very early on that people were crystallizing sugar or possibly honey into like a hard candy. So they were caramelizing sweets in that way. But it really wasn't until in America in about the 1840s, 1850s, that um, the settlers who had been caramelizing sugar, and we also talked before around that same time, maple sugar. Yes. So they've been caramelizing and kind of doing a process with that. So with regular, now that cane sugar became more accessible because we had better trade with Europe, then... They started to add some milk to it to soften it, and that's how they kind of developed caramel sauce and caramels and things like that. So Milton Hershey actually had the first successful, his candy business in 1886 was the Lancaster Caramel Company. But this is um, a candy bar on a stick that was first developed in 1925. Okay. And it's, I mean, you say candy bar, but it's really just a chunk of caramel. Now, although it is milk caramel... It's in between a candy bar and a lollipop. And so the guy who invented this was um, a chemist named Frank at the James O. Welch Company. And the portable caramel lollipop, originally called Papa Sucker, because their tagline was, of all the pop family, this is the Papa. Okay. Like, it's the biggest of all the lollipops. It is rather large. And we actually have the junior size. Oh, okay. So it changed its name in 1932. To su- suggest a wealth of sweetness, hence the sugar daddy. Ah. And then the James O. Welch Company was bought by Nabisco in 1963, but they kept this really vintage yellow and red packaging. This, um, like, wax paper so that it doesn't stick, mm-hmm. right? And then they were sold to Tootsie Roll in 1993. They really became more popular in the 70s, so... Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs had that Battle of the Sexes yes. tennis match. Yep, tennis there match. There have been a couple movies made about it. I'll link it on our Watch With Us blog. But apparently, they wanted some kind of, like, they ended up sponsoring them. Sugar Daddies. And they sold one pound, like, enormous one pound Sugar Daddy caramel lollipops. I do not know what that has to do with tennis. Right. (laughs) But they sold these giant one pound lollipops. And at that point, then they had all these commercials and they became really popular. So I remember from these two memories. Do you have any like specific memories of this? I do not. My memories of sugar daddies are chewier Mm -hmm. than this. These are pretty hard. They've been in our cupboard in the cold yeah, that could be why. I remember them being a bit chewier. I, I've had I had some sugar daddies. They weren't like a go-to snack for me, but I worked in a Boy Scout camp for many summers, and they would have they had these amongst other candies at the Trading Post, mm-hmm. which was like this little shop. Yeah. And so I mean, you know, they were something that I've had before. And I did you them. have sugar babies? Sugar babies are like a small, almost like a jelly bean version of this, where it's like a very, it's a little bit softer caramel. Yeah, I think I have. I think that's more of what I had. And then in the 80s, they also had the Sugar Mama. From 1960 to 1980, 1965 into the 1980s, which was, they did the opposite. They Instead of a yellow wrapper, they did red with, with yellow, yellow words. Red. Okay. And I, it, was, it was covered in chocolate. Okay, interesting. No, I think you'd be surprised to know, but I've never had a sugar mama. <laughs> I, I feel like I need to bleep that joke nope. out. <laughs> um, so my memory is actually, well, my first one is they sold these at 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven was just around the corner from my house. It was about a block away. Mm-hmm. And so we would all ride our bikes, my, my brother and my cousins and I, we would ride our bikes to 7-Eleven. You could use your dollar to buy a sugar daddy. And my, my cousin, I won't say which one, but she used to stick it on the roof of her mouth and like lick it. Mm-hmm. And she'd ride her bike with this <laughs> lollipop like stuck to the roof of her mouth. Um, I know other people who would like dip it in milk. It does take a while to get through, so some people would freeze it. But my other memory is of camp as well. We had these in our camp store, and I was, sorry to tell you, Steve, I did date other people before I met you at the age of 
36. <laughs> so, um, and this is when you had a sugar dad. Right? I did not have a sugar dad. Well, I had I had the candy. That's what I'm talking and about. I was dating someone and I said, oh my gosh, these were my favorite childhood candies. So he bought two of them. We ate them, but we of course didn't finish them. So we put them back in his car on the dashboard in the summer. And they melted They all melted over. into... Like yeah. into the dashboard. That's what he gets. <laughs> it took us probably two hours eventually. And we couldn't <laughs> even clean it because we were camp counselors. Right. So we had to wait until the weekend when the kids were gone. And there was just caramel everywhere. <laughs> but um, because of that, I have not eaten one of these. And that was, I know, that was 1999. So that's the last time I had a sugar daddy. And they're my favorite. So 23 years. Now I feel old. You didn't have to do the math on that. Yeah. So, yeah, they're pretty good. So, ratings, okay, out of five UFOs for Flight of the Navigator, okay. how many do you rate the Sugar Daddy? Well, I have to say, I think the hardness that we're getting is because of where I stored them. So, I think if, the, don't don't bite into it, you're going to ruin your teeth. Don't, I don't you wanna, judge me. I don't want this podcast to cost us like thousands in dentist mm. bills. Um, we may, we, you may, we ha, may have to put a Patreon up for my teeth. <laughs> Patreon account just for Steve's dental work from the candy. Yeah. Um, it's a little grainier than I remember, though. Mm-hmm. But it is, it's got a great flavor. I like, I'd like to keep eating it instead of talking right now. I think I'm going to have to go with a four. You know, we talked about slow candy versus fast candy. This is like, you would have to save this, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so four. So four. I, this is my grading scale. It is caramel, which automatically bumps it up because I like caramel a lot. Okay, but my perfect caramel are the little caramel bites that come in the clear wrapper. We can't have those. I know, but they're the perfect caramel. They're chewy, they're soft, and you can devour them in seconds. I will tell you why they are like that, because they they're made out of flour, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> essentially. This yeah. has that caramel taste, mm-hmm. and I do like it. So normally it would start at a five. Okay. It is a slow candy, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, which knocks it down to a four. Okay. Because I can't devour in seconds. And that fights my patience. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And now the only other bad thing is it has a stick jammed up the middle of it. That I now have to eat around. So that makes it a three. So it's a good three, but it's a three. So. Three Three and and a half half UFOs. UFOs. Three and a half UFOs for sugar daddies. Um, that's a pretty good score, considering that it's a candy from 1925. It's almost 100 years of Yeah, it's sugar pretty daddy. good. There's no shame in that. I enjoyed it. But if you want to move it up to a five UFO, Tootsie Roll Industries, pull the stick out, soften it up, and you'll get a five so UFO. So basically, you just want sugar babies, which I don't like at all. That's what you're saying. You're mm. like, make this softer and smaller so I can pop it in my mouth. And they're like, we have sugar babies, Steve. Why don't you just buy those? Okay. The fact is that your wife could not find sugar babies. So she could All right. find the sugar daddies. Um, okay. So, Flight of the Navigator. Flight of the Navigator. This was a suggestion sent in to us by Will Bouchard. So, we thank you for that suggestion. So, Steve, can you give us the summary of the movie? Sure. So, this movie starts off in 1978 with young David Freeman, who's 12 years old, and he we meet his family briefly. He has a younger brother who's eight, and that night, he has to go get his brother, so he's cutting through the woods. He falls into a ravine and loses consciousness. He wakes up, what he thinks is just a little while later, and goes to his house, and his parents don't live there anymore. And we soon find out that Young David has missed eight years, and it is now 1986. Yeah, it's a cool time dilation. It's a time dilation, yeah. And so he doesn't know what's going on. The police are called, and they end up reuniting him with his family. But, of course, they're bringing him to a doctor because he has not aged, and everyone else has. Mm -hmm. His younger brother, who was eight, is now 16, and his older brother. Um, His parents look older, and so um, there's a lot of confusion and things like that. At the same time, we see that there's a spaceship that's crashed, and NASA um, confiscates that. Basically, they make the connection between David and the ship, 
They end up coming and getting David and bringing him to their facility. Uh, David doesn't like being there. He escapes with the help of a friend that he kind of meets there um, and with the help of the ship. And then there's a decent chunk of the movie with David flying around in the ship as the navigator. The ship, as we find, is an AI. It's an artificial intelligence. It's robotic. And so it perceives David as the navigator that kind of helps it get where it needs to get. And they fly all over the place, and you see all sorts of different scenic areas of the world. Um, Tokyo, under the ocean, Texas, California, Miami, all sorts of stuff. Before, finally, we find out that the spaceship has to download star charts out of David's brain. So it needs to scan his brain. So it scans his brain, gets its star charts, along with some of his personality. So he becomes kind of a smart aleck, and they start fighting and arguing, and then they're driving. The, they're each taking turns driving the ship. And then at the end, of course, um, the ship takes David home, but he finds that there's NASA is there, and so are the police and everybody else. And David realizes that he can't really return home because he's going to be a lab rat the rest of his life. Right. And so he convinces the ship to make the risky maneuver of traveling back through time. And trying to drop him off in 1978 where he left. Which apparently the ship can do, but it was worried because humans are delicate. Right. Yeah, so it, it didn't, didn't... want to take it didn't want to take that risk with him. Right. And then that's how it ends. And it ends with him being dropped off and he wakes up in the ravine again and his family is how he left them originally and you know, it's still the same night, and they don't even realize what's happened. And then he tells his family that he loves them. He tells his family that he loves them. And then it's 4th of July fireworks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's really interesting. I like that you mentioned that it's got a little bit of comedy and humor kind of in there, because initially this was quite a more serious film. Mark Baker was a UCLA film student, and his initial version was called Vanished. And okay. this is a quote from him. In my story, they build the ship from his memory. So they're experimenting with technology that they don't understand, but David does. And it gets to a point where he realizes they're never going to let him go. And apparently that was how it originally ended. <laughs> like, wow. much more dark. So this, you know, scripts get, like, kind of reworked. And yes. especially from a film student. So it was first picked up by Viking, which was a Norway-based company production company mm -hmm. um still doing it in english but they started apparently the filming and then they went bankrupt so producer sales organization was like an action movie production company mm -hmm. and they wanted to have like the government tries to shoot down the spaceship and then chases and things like that and then disney then came into the picture to get the movie and they wanted to more focus on the family story mm -hmm. so you can kind of see some of those elements i think in different parts of the film which to me is kind of interesting different people considered for david included joaquin phoenix okay if i'm saying his name right and chris o'donnell okay um but they really wanted somebody more natural and they they found joey kramer now he had had small parts both before and kind of after he had like a failed Disney pilot. He had an uncredited part in Neverending Story. Um, he had a very small part in Clan of the Cave Bear, the Daryl Hannah movie. Uh -huh. And really what happened is that after this movie came out, he struggled with being so famous. He He's really in every scene of this film, which for a young kid is you're carrying the movie at 12, right? Yes. And he wanted to be a normal kid, so they offered him Wesley Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation. And he turned it down. He turned it down to go and be a regular kid, but even after that, he struggled for a while. He got into drugs and things like that. Yeah, I, I have a list here. Between 2008 and 2011, careless storage of a firearm, possession of substances to traffic, consuming liquor in public, possession of a weapon for dangerous purposes, and then, of course, in 2016, he was arrested for bank robbery. Yeah, I, I'm glad that he's doing well now. Like, that's <laughs> that's the important part. Um that is a lot of, you know, we talked about a couple weeks ago, we did um, Dream a Little Dream, and that's what the, the Corys went through as well, right? Kids, mm -hmm. kids who went through the Hollywood system, especially back then, they just were not, I hope that they're treated better now. 
because the the exploitation in Hollywood was pretty bad. Um, but he's doing well now. He turned his life around. He did a there's a documentary I'll link on the blog called Life After Navigator. Mm -hmm. But he talks about basically how he got back on the right path and things like that. Um, anyway, most of the movie was shot in Florida. But part of it, because of the Viking company, when they were low on funds, yep. they shot indoor scenes in Norway with a stand-in for David. But the kid who played David did not speak English, the stand-in. <laughs> so apparently they had this whole thing where, like, the director only speaks English. The, the stand-in only speaks Norwegian. Um, it was quite a bit difficult. Interesting. They had the puppeteer for Max fill in for the voice while they were looking for somebody to find the voice. The producer, the new producer, mm -hmm. once it was in Disney's hands, he saw an episode of Pee-wee's Playhouse, and then they asked Paul Rubens to do the voice. And kind of famously, like, now everybody knows that it's Paul Rubens. But at the time, he was doing Pee-wee's Playhouse, and he kind of had that as a character. Yeah. And he chose the name Paul Mall, which is kind of Yeah, like that's, this, what he's, that's what he's credited as on the thing. Kind of like the cigarettes. Yeah, Paul Mall, yeah. Um, so instead of getting a normal credit, because he kind of wanted to keep it like under wraps that he mm. was doing this voice. Um, it was not a secret. It, it sounds exactly like Pee Wee Herman once he starts. Once he starts, he yeah, yeah. There's a certain point where he starts joking around. Before that, though, I don't think I would have known. Oh, okay. But at any rate, the film was released a few months before the opening of Star Tours at Disneyland, where Paul Rubens also voiced the robotic pilot for that ride. I loved that ride. I, I Star Tours is like my favorite ride at Disney World, besides Body Wars, which doesn't exist anymore. So Randall Kaiser directed, and he he was known for Grease mm -hmm. and Blue Lagoon. <laughs> I can't say that without laughing. He also later on worked with Paul Rubens again to do Pee Wee's Big Top, mm -hmm. and he did another Disney ride. He did Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, which is like a 4D theater kind of experience yeah because he had also directed honey I, I blew up the kid okay so not honey i shrunk the kids but like the sequel what i find interesting is that they have all this connection to you know disney there was the ride there was all this and i always remember disney's flight of the navigator but it was sent to disney originally and disney didn't approve it they sent it to pso and made a deal letting them distribute it in the united states yeah it seems like they with did. them basically staying as the overall they had had, and I can't remember now which movie it was, but they, they had another movie with like a space connection and it hadn't really done well. And this is also, if you remember from when we did Splash, mm -hmm. they haven't had quite, and also Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So they haven't, they've just started to branch out into Touchstone. Yes. They haven't had yet the Disney Renaissance in terms of animated features. So this is kind of like a weird middle... Like, they did a number of movies like this that were, like, family films that I don't want to get too much into the reception. I'm guessing it kind of did okay. <laughs> right, 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 yep. So, uh, some of the other people starring in this. Okay, here's what bothers me. If you look this up, we're going to tell you the truth here on this podcast, folks. If you look up, like, Flight of the Navigator Fun Facts mm -hmm. or Flight of the Navigator History, almost every website says that this is Sarah Jessica Parker's first film. Sarah Jessica Parker is probably best known for Sex in the City, mm -hmm. unless you're Megan and you really know her from <laughs> Footloose. Right. Um, which she did before this movie. She also did Girls Just Want to Have Fun. And she actually, it's kind of like Jennifer Aniston with Leprechaun. Like, she doesn't like talking about this movie for whatever reason. Okay. My guess is that, it, you know, she has kind of an important role in the film, but she's not actually on film that long. My guess is she yeah. didn't film it that many days, and she kind of has said, like... She's not a lead. She's a supporting actress. Right, and it. she's kind of said, like, I went in and got a paycheck for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't really remember it that well, and I right. don't really know too much even what it's about by this point, you know? The mom is played by Veronica Cartwright, and she's known for a lot of sci-fi and horror alien Mm -hmm. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Witches of Eastwick, tons of stuff. The dad is played by Cliff DeYoung. Now, he's done, like, a number of movies and TV shows. Both he and the kid playing David had 
um, small roles on Murder, She Wrote, which I think is okay. because everybody, every actor from the 80s mm-hmm. and 90s did. Um, but he was also in a 60s rock group called Clear Light. Okay. Which I think is kind of interesting. Matthew Adler, who plays the older Jeff, the mm-hmm. 16-year-old Jeff, we just saw him in Dream a Little Dream. Yep, he played Dumas. He played Dumas. And he was also in Teen Wolf. He does a lot of voiceover work now. And he's married to Laura San Giacomo, who is oh, okay. in the better version of The Stand, <laughs> which we'll talk about someday. Howard Hessman plays NASA's uh, top guy, Louis Faraday. He was also in WKRP and Head of the Class. Johnny Fever. Yeah. I know him better from Head of the Class. He was the teacher in Head of the Class, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it was a show about nerd geniuses. Of course, I was mm-hmm. watching that. Yep. Howard Hessman uh, just passed away in January. Oh, no. Yep. Oh, I'm so um, sad. Complications to uh, colon COVID. surgery. Oh, my goodness. Yep. He was 81. Yeah. So, I mean, he lived a long life. Bring down the podcast. <laughs> I'm so sad about that. Um, so, moving on from the casting, the effects. The special effects were really cutting edge for the time. They were very early CGI, essentially. Not all of them, because you can still be, you can still go on the ship. It's like on the Disney back lot somewhere. But this was done in a really complicated way, and I don't totally understand it. But it's basically, they digitized moving images from videotape, and okay. then they transferred them onto background film plates. And they rendered this spaceship using, at the time, basically a supercomputer. Yep. And the computer would crash like five or six times a day because it was like trying so hard to render the spaceship correctly. (laughs) Um, So it kind of caused chaos in the production. And then we also have a high-tech soundtrack. This was composed by Alan Silvestri, who's a very famous film composer. But this was the first soundtrack that he did. Now, I'm not talking about like the songs that they put in, but the score, mm-hmm. right? So this was the first score that he did that was completely digitized on synthesizers. Everything was electronic. It was inspired by like new wave music mm-hmm. and the sci-fi genre. Um, they've had a reboot kind of planned since 2009. In 2020, they tapped Bryce Dallas Howard to direct. Mm-hmm. Um, but then that was right when COVID hit. So it's not clear if the project was like canceled or delayed. It's kind of in limbo right now. So we yeah. might we might have a new Flight of the Navigator, yeah. probably just for Disney Plus, but we don't know yet. That's what I. I that's kind of what I had seen too. Is that they were going to do that. And it was going to be a switch. It'll be a female lead. What I think would be interesting, because it's an eight-year gap, Mm -hmm. and we'll get into this, but they really try to show the differences between the 70s and the 80s. Yes. I think it would be cool if they did, like, 98 to, like, 2008, like that 10-year gap. Because you have, like... We have internet, but it's not great to, like, everybody has internet and cell phones. And the internet is on the cell phones. You know what I mean? I think it would be a really cool jump. So, with that, we're going to take a brief break. And when we come back, we'll talk about our memories of the movie. And then we'll get into our full review and recap. This podcast is supported by its creators. And listeners like you. Help keep our show ad-free by visiting our website, StopRuiningMyChildhood.com. There you can find links to our social media. And this very podcast you're currently listening to. Both Megan and I are authors, and you can find links to our books on our About page. And on our Watch With Us page, you can find videos and links for all the shows and movies we discuss on the podcast. And more importantly, links to buy the nostalgic snacks we review as well. We also post bonus content about once a month. So like, subscribe, and follow. For a small, independent podcast like ours, it really does make a difference. Thanks. And now, back to the show. All right, welcome back. My name's Megan. And I'm Steve. In case you forgot. Um, So, Memories of Flight of the Navigator. Did you see it in theaters? I did not. I saw it at the drive-ins. Oh, that's even better. Yeah. I I remember seeing it at the drive-ins. Would have been in the summertime, 1986. We used to go to the drive-ins a few times in the summer when I was a child. I remember seeing it, in the, and I remember pieces of it and liking it. But I'm going to be honest, that was probably the last time I saw it. 
Really? Yeah. So we're. So I mean, you didn't have it on VHS or DVD or anything like that. No. So I mean, we're talking, you know, thirty six years probably. Yeah. It's been so I saw it. No, we never had it on DVD or anything like that. How? I know you have a really good memory. Did you remember a lot of it, or did you like? Was it kind of like watching most it for the of first what time? I remembered was the scene was him in the ship. Right. With the ship swiveling around talking to him. Yeah. That's most of what I remembered. I didn't remember a lot of the other stuff, but that would have been kind of boring to, I mean, at the time I'm nine, right? So to an eight or nine year old, that would have been a little bit dull. Some of the talking parts would have been a little dull. Yeah. Well, for me, those are the parts I remember too, but the reason for that, Steve, Steve and I kind of laugh about this all the time. This is not the first movie where this has happened. My brother and I, we, we agreed on this movie that we both really liked it. So that meant that we watched it a lot. Now, okay. we had it on VHS, but we had it on VHS the way you would tape things on VHS was like you could make the tape two hours or eight hours, right? Yes. So we had this VHS tape and that we had free Disney for a week. So they would do a promotion where the Disney Channel you had to pay for and get on cable, but they would like kind of take over ABC for a week or they would right. have like you could tune into a station that wasn't normally there or mm-hmm. whatever. So the funny thing is that Steve and I are watching this and I said to him, I'm going to tell you the point at which our VHS picked this up. <laughs> and Steve goes, OK. And I paused it and he goes, Oh, do you need to like get up and walk around for a second? I go, no, no, this is where our VHS picked up. And he was like, what? That's a third of the way into the movie. It was about 25 minutes. You lost all the foundation for the movie. Now, I know that I've seen the whole thing at some point, Mm -hmm. but I think like you, maybe one time maybe two times and then really my my memory is just the tape that we had so i really did not remember the beginning of this at all okay it's interesting because when we get into our review to me this plays for adults a lot differently than it plays for kids i think what stands out to me as an adult and what stood out to me as a kid are quite different i'm not going to say i ruined my childhood necessarily although the fun facts and history part might have just a couple <laughs> minutes ago but yeah i to me it's it hit a lot differently. I, I will tell you my other memory that I will say is as much as I remembered the scenes with him in the ship with the with the machine, Max as he calls it, I don't recall Pee Wee Herman being in this. Mm. And when we were preparing for this and I was doing some research, I saw Paul Rubens plays Max. And I'm like, really? I don't remember that at all. And then as we watch it and he starts talking, I go, oh, that's definitely Paul Rubens. Yeah. Like if Pee Wee's Funhouse was just beginning... Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how much I would have seen it yet before this. So that's an interesting point, too, because I was not allowed to watch that show. Okay. And also, much later, like in the 90s, I was probably in middle school, somebody had... Mm -hmm. They were going to watch one of the Pee Wee Herman movies, Mm -hmm. and I was like, it was very um, kind of dark and crass, and it was not for me. And I was just like, okay, bye. (laughs) And I left. Yeah. So I really didn't have too much. I would not have recognized at the time that it was him. Mm-hmm. Right. There were two things that I did remember from this. And the one well, first that Sarah Jessica Parker was like the cool girl that I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. But that she had purple hair and she mentions Twisted Sister. And I did not get that joke. <laughs> and Because again. Right. I was would not have been listening to that or been allowed to. And the second thing is the the gas station attendant that they make fun of. Right. I don't want to kind of preview that too much because I want to talk about who that is and, and what right. that particular actor is doing now. But, All right. So yeah. let's jump into the full review, right? Um, this really movie is kind of three acts. In the first act, we start off, it, it opens with 1978 and the family is watching a dog frisbee competition yeah they have some fake outs here there's some great fake outs in this in the <laughs> it, there's the frisbee there's the blimp yeah and then a water tower all when he looks up and you expect to see a spaceship yeah so i kind of liked that because it builds up that anticipation the frisbee is a really cool visual kind of a joke but it, it's yeah. a really cool visual because it's this like um slow motion of a silver flying object with the city in the background yeah as the credits are opening and i mean if you if you went yeah. to see this movie you knew you're going to see a spaceship movie 
Yeah. Right. So I mean, you so you're expecting of, it. Yeah. So you assume that that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, we're going to see the spaceship right away. So they build up your anticipation. To me, this is like, you know, we talked about this with Willy Wonka, how they build up your anticipation, but it takes forever. Yeah. This was just the right amount of time. The, the blimp comes and the parents are like, they just kind of stand for a second and the sky goes dark and then they look up and, oh, it's a blimp. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny to me. Yeah, so the first part kind of establishes the characters a little bit that, you know, it's just kind of a normal American family. I think that's what they're trying to show. They do, yeah. And, you know, his brother's a pain in the butt. And he's kind of, you know, he's younger than him by four years. And and they're calling each other names. Um, So it's interesting. And then, you know, quickly, it's they get home and it's that night. And he has to go get his brother. And his brother kind of jumps out of the woods and scares him, then runs off. And it's at that point that he falls into the ravine. You know, they could have done, like, lights from the sky or something. And they don't. They don't he do falls anything. in the ravine, and then it's like a minute later, he gets up, and he climbs out of the ravine and goes home. Yeah, I really liked that because his point of view is that for him, nothing has happened. Yes. That he did fall in the re So they almost set it up to be a little bit of a mystery. And it's your point of view, too. So it's not yes. like you realize that eight years has passed. Right. You don't find it out until he's figuring it out and finding it out. Mm-hmm. Um. So, so David comes to, before we get to his parents, you know, and his reunification with them. Mm-hmm. David comes to talk about the house. He goes back to his house. Oh, David comes too, and he runs back to his house, which he's only, I mean, he's not far away from, right? Yeah. He runs back to his house, and he goes to unto the door, and it's locked. So he bangs on it, and some lady opens the door in a silk robe, yes. who is not his mother, obviously. And he's like, where's my mom? Where's my dad? And he goes running through the house, runs upstairs into another room where it's like a little den, and there's a man sitting there in a silk robe, with a sh- with a- an Oxford shirt and slacks on under the silk robe. So these people are just sh- hanging out in silk robes. I think that they were supposed to be super into Japanese culture and these are kimonos. Because they also show a stark difference in decorating in this house. Oh yeah, the fern wallpaper. And I said to Steve, look at the wallpaper. No, well they have fern wallpaper in one room, but along the staircase it's black wallpaper with white fans and i yeah. think that they're like japanese well, it's or very, asian it's very 80s too it's very, compared to the 78 yeah it is so 80s and i think that's the first sign that we're not in 78 anymore right. because 78 was still like avocado appliances yes and harvest gold walls and this is like a total departure a total departure i thought it was hysterical it's it's hysterical but also terrifying yeah because he can really he's see freaking it. out because he yeah. can't find his parents and they finally call the police who come and get him they bring him to the police station and it takes them a little bit of time to id him because of course it's before computers were widespread right and so they finally do find a missing persons report on him but of course it's dated eight years ago and it lists him wearing the exact same thing he's wearing right now Yeah, i really liked this part as well because again the cops are trying to decipher this mystery the same way the audience is Mm -hmm. the same way david is that they're reading like he was presumed dead and he was wearing a polo shirt and short shorts yeah. And the fact that he's still very clearly still 12, not right, 20. Right, And she says, well, look at the date. And the cop says, well, it's obviously a typo. Yes. And she says, no, I checked it three times. Yeah. They do find where his parents now live, and they bring him there. And on the way, they're asking him questions like, how old are you? You know, who's, who's the, the president? Who's the president? And he's like, Carter, duh. Yeah. <laughs> he's like irritated. Like, why are you asking me all these questions? Yeah. So we get to the house. This was another highlight for me when the parents come out. I don't know if they did the makeup earlier to make them look younger Mm -hmm. or if they did the makeup here to make them look older. And that's a good thing that I don't know. Yeah. Because the makeup is so excellently done. A lot of times they go too far. Here, his mom has some wrinkles. His dad has a receding hairline a bit. 
and gray at the temples. They do look like they've gone yeah. from 32 to 40. Yeah, and it's noticeable to him. It's noticeable Because to he him. knows it's yeah. his parents, but yeah. he, he also knows there's something n- n- noticeably different But they don't that. go from looking like they're 30 to looking like they're 60. <laughs> right. Right? They, it's a very subtle change, but I think that it worked extremely well. And then they ship him off to the hospital. <laughs> well, yeah. They, well, they take him to the hospital to, to figure out why he hasn't aged in eight years. Yeah, and this point is, to me, this was kind of my low light. So the brother standing in the doorway, which I liked. Mm-hmm. I liked that. He's in shadow. The light's behind him, right? Then he comes into the light of the room, and you can see that he's 16. Right. And that he's now older than David. So now David understands it's not that his mom and dad look different. Right. It's that... He's it's eight years later. He, he tells David, "You should be 20. Well, the thing is, that's the thing. His brother is the one who tells him, "Like, what the heck, mom and dad?" Yeah, nobody else. Well, they probably you wouldn't have thought that. They're just happy their kids back. You know, I mean, Jeff, the younger, older brother now, you know, mentions things to him like, "Mom and dad had me putting up like missing posters every Saturday, like for yeah. years. They were freaking out, looking for you. You know." Well, that's, um, so I wrote this down because I thought this was the most important quote. They made me put posters up on every telephone pole and tree for years, every Saturday. You should have seen mom. She kept all the stuff in your room. She refused to believe you were dead. Like, And they moved. And, they, and she kept all the stuff. Yes. When they moved in. And I almost feel like, I don't know if we could, if you noticed this, but I think the fact they moved was not only to throw him off when he comes home, right? But... They move to a worse area, and it's a smaller house. It's like yeah. because of him missing, they're not in the in the same area they were anymore. Yeah, they're not. Lives, in a, their lives have gone downhill. Their lives have gone kind of into disarray. And to me, again, as an adult, this is the part that hit because in the eighties we had a lot of stories of missing kids, mm-hmm. um, milk cartons. Yeah, Eaton Pats disappeared in nineteen seventy nine at the age of six. Um, his disappearance helped launch the missing children's movement and that had new legislation and new methods for tracking down missing kids so that you, before that you had to wait 24 hours, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the computers did also help because they helped to track people across state lines and all of that. Mm-hmm. We also had Adam Walsh yep. who went missing in 1981. He was abducted from a department store. And that launched his father John into a lot of advocacy for children's r- missing but yes. also into America's Most Wanted. Right. So Eaton Pats was one of the first children to be profiled on the milk cartons which Steve just mentioned. In the late 80s the pediatrician Benjamin Spock said that the milk cartons t- terrified small children at the breakfast table with the implication that they too might be abducted mm. and we had all this like stranger danger yeah and we had P- we had a cop come into our school when i was in kindergarten to teach us about stranger danger and he had me do a demonstration where he was like following me and i started booking it <laughs> i started running and he was like megan just did the exact right thing and i was like <laughs> yeah you're following me i'm gonna run like stop following me creepo but like they would have announcements in our school school steve if somebody in a van asks you to get in you don't do it like in the morning announcements after pledge of allegiance but there was all sorts of stuff like during this time like parents i don't know if your parents did it but like where parents had you had like a password yes i so like if an adult came and said hey something happened to your parents you need to come with me they needed to know the password okay my password was peanut butter and jelly I was at this after school thing for brownies because mm-hmm. remember I was in brownies for like two years. My neighbor came and she was going to pick me up and I said, I'm not going with you. Now, I only live like a block from the school <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm just going to walk home. And she was like, Megan, there's two feet of snow on the ground. And I was like, I can't go with her because she doesn't know. And then she said my password and everybody heard it. She was like, peanut butter and jelly. And I was like, don't say my password so loud. <laughs> <laughs> and now she's my Facebook friend and probably listens to this podcast. Okay, then. I don't know if she remembers that. but I, Nice it, job ruining the password. <laughs> it freaked me out that somebody said my password out loud because other grown-ups could hear it. Yeah. It did not occur to me, Steve, that I could just get a new password. I wanted a password so bad. <laughs> oh, I didn't have one. Yeah, I was I a latchkey kid and I was home alone most of the no, time. I was like super paranoid yeah. at that age and like super into like getting a password. But my point is that... As an adult, that's what sticks out to me watching this, right? That if I had kids 
how terrifying it would be for one of them to just go missing. And you, they did presume him dead and probably moved at about that time. And then the tone of the movie kind of shifts a little bit later, not quite yet, but a little bit later to be way more humorous. And I feel like that's the Disney part kind of right, coming right. into it. And, you know, it's probably the Disney piece. One of the things that actually surprises me is that eight years later when he does come back, I mean, it shows the hardships, but his parents are still together. And many missing children issues, the parents divorced. So I was going to say that, too. That's the one thing that I kind of, watching it back, I didn't remember. Because also, we're not to the point yet where I had this on tape. This whole section we're talking about, I have never really seen but what maybe once. I kind of expected only his mom to be at the door or only his dad. Right. I didn't expect them to be together. So that was kind of nice that at least the family was kind of um, still together. But the kids in the hospital, they're running tests on him like he's a lab experiment. I have to say, too, the acting is really superb here. We didn't get to see too much. The guy who played Dumas in Dream a Little Dream, yeah. he has more of a like bully cartoonish role. Matt, is it Matt Adler? Yeah. yeah. Here, he's really, um, he's looking up thyroid conditions. because he's, he's concerned about it. <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, he says, you know, one of the first things he says is, I'm sorry I scared you in the woods. Yeah, he's probably thinking he about that. Because he scared him that night and he said, I've been, I felt really bad about it all this time. Yeah, um, I would probably feel guilty about that too. So it flashes from this point to the crashed spaceship. It kind of transitions from him in the hospital to the crashed spaceship. So we finally see it. We see the space ship um that's crashed into a few power poles and a security guy is there talking with the police are there nasa shows up in in a light bar police car that says nasa on the side (laughs) all right again i'm not i don't want to ruin our childhoods because oh but that is kind of the thing right but i feel like the screenwriters here didn't have a really strong understanding of nasa yeah. And they, and how far their reach is because they don't have the ability to have police cars with NASA on the side. They don't have the ability later in the movie to basically keep the family in their house. Well, <laughs> let's think about this, though. They don't right now. Right. But this was like space race. Well, it's the space race, yeah. But still, I mean, NASA I mean, is like... But, but, it's a lot of physicists and mathematicians. And they are slightly connected to the Air Force. I'm just saying <laughs> that Reagan put out Star Wars at this point. Right. Which was like a defense plan for possible <laughs> yep. defense system. Mm-hmm. Like using NASA. Um, but yes, they... Steve goes, NASA has their own car. <laughs> yeah. With a light bar, like a police car. I'm like, like, even if it was just a company car that had a NASA logo, okay. They, they also, I wrote this in my notes. This is, again, the tone of this at this point. They have this set up full on like a murder scene. And if this was... It's it, like taped off? Yes. It looks like a scene straight out of Law & Order where like the cars all rush up, there's police tape, and then they do a slow reveal of the spaceship. Yeah. There's police tape around the, the the perimeter, but the spaceship is floating. It's floating. It could just go right past the police tape. And, and he goes, how are we going to move it? And the guy just touches it with his finger and it just And it floats. floats. It just kind of pushes away, yeah. Oh my goodness. It was hysterically funny to me. Like, I don't know if they intended that to be funny or not, but why did they have it roped off like a murder's happened? So we, we have then the transporting of the ship, and then David wakes up. In the hospital, and he goes, it's hurt, and it's calling me. Yeah. And Jeff is reading about thyroid conditions, trying to figure out if that's what's wrong with his brother, which I thought was so sweet. It was, yeah. Um, and, uh, and then they go into some other tests, and David kind of doesn't want to say what the dream was or what he heard in his mind. Right. And they hook him up to a biofeedback machine. Electrode machine prints out a picture of the spaceship. Yes. And that's what gets NASA's attention. So then they send that to NASA. Somebody presumably at the hospital knows this guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it probably, it, it takes a while, most likely because it was a big print and they had yeah. to fax it. They have this really cool shot. Whoever, you know, the guy who directed this did Grease and Blue Lagoon, but this is such a cool directorial choice where... They pull out the print, the printout very slowly, and he looks down, and then he looks up at the ship. But you don't see the ship; you see the ship reflected in the glass that mm-hmm. he's behind. Yes, it's just such a cool shot. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so that was one of my highlights. There, it kind of reminded me. There's a couple different movies that it reminded me of, like Splash or E.T. 
fire starter Mm -hmm. that there was this kind of fear in the 80s and i think it kind of came out you know in the public imagination especially after watergate in the 70s that the government does not care about you and that they will experiment on you right (laughs) and you know we talked about child abduction but the the lore of alien abduction kind of came about in the 70s and early 80s as well so it, the, the mishmash of that here so he agrees to go with the nasa folks yeah that really moves us into the second act which is his time at nasa yeah and he has no phone he's locked in but he does have a remote control and he turns on the TV and it's MTV. Yes, which he of course has no idea what it is. And Sarah Jessica Parker comes in and he's like, "What the heck is this? Where's Starsky and Hutch?" <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite show. And she says, "They canceled that like a long time ago." Yeah, this. Have you ever seen a music video? He goes, "No," and she goes, "Weirdo," and he goes, "I'm not the one with the purple hair." That joke is right where my my video picked up. <laughs> So okay. that's how far in we so were. So basically a third of the movie. Yes. You've missed all of this groundwork but, of him being, in, to, you know, him losing eight years of his family. Well, you kind of pick that up. Right. But it doesn't set the stage at all for like the, the torment his family's been through. Right. Or the fact that he's kind of in a precarious position, right? So she says, yeah, she goes, yeah, I got it at a concert. And he goes, oh, I've been to a concert. My mom took me to the Bee Gees. Yeah. And she's like, just <laughs> looks at him like, what she kind says, of nerd I are you? I like the Twisted Sister. And she says it proudly, like, you know, because Twisted Sister was a big oh, deal. Gosh. Right? And he goes, who's she? <laughs> yes. Awesome joke. Such a good joke. But I did not get that at the at the age of like nine or ten right. whenever I watched this. But it's a good joke. But the idea of how much the world has changed just in those eight years that we've gone from... Bee Gees to Twisted Sister that we've got from Starsky and Hutch to I Want My MTV. Right. <laughs> right. And he would be 20 and she's an intern. So she really is like his age. I wish that they had done like a tag at the end. I want, I wanted older David to get together with her. Because yeah. he remembers at the end what happened. Right. But he, this is another good joke. He asks for, uh, he's like, I'll have a Big Mac and a Coke if that's still around. And she goes, well, yeah, but do you want a new Coke, classic Coke, cherry Coke, diet Coke, caffeine-free Coke? (laughs) And he's like, what? Like, I just want a Coke. My goodness. So they start running tests on him. And the promise here when he came to NASA was he'd only be there for 48 hours. They start running tests on him and they, they put the electrodes on him as well. And every time they ask him a question, he says, I don't know, but the answer pops up on the screen. Which I thought was a really cool way to do it. Like they say, where have you been? And he says, I don't know. And and it says, under assessment at Phylon. Yeah. Which is the name of the planet. They ask him a number of other things that shows specs of the ship, of all of, of the alien language, star charts, all this stuff that's in his mind that he didn't know was in oh, there. Oh, yeah. And Louis Faraday even says, this is going to take years for us to decode all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, he said 48 hours is not enough time. Yeah. So you can tell right away that he's kind of in trouble. He yeah. also, they also have Louis listening in on his phone call to his parents. Uh-huh. So he's like on the other line. And again, you get this sense of really being trapped. David also realizes that there's men behind the glass. He's like, I've seen movies. Movies before right. I have a TV, you know. Um, so there's two way mirror basically, uh-huh. like in cop shows, right? right? Um, and they're kind of watching him that way as well. Basically, they talk about the science a little bit. He moved beyond the speed of light. He was gone 4.4 hours, but the Earth aged eight years. So they're kind of using Einstein's theory of relativity. This was interesting. It's light yeah. speed theory. And this jumped at me because I know light speed theory from one of my favorite books of all time, Ender's Game. Yes. By Orson Scott Card. Yes. Right? In Ender's Game, Ender near at the end of the book and in, in the sequel is traveling using light speed theory, which basically says that you can never reach the speed of light. But the closer you get to the speed of light, the the faster time works. Or the, technically the slower time works where you are, but other places not. Right. So basically if you were flying near the speed of light and you traveled out to Pluto, 
Mm -hmm. And it took you four months. By the time you got back to Earth, like 60 years could have gone by. Yeah, they kind of use this, like, they kind of play with it sometimes in Star Trek. Like, it's implied that some of the characters are older because they've been traveling around faster than the speed of light. And it's interesting because Ender's Game came out in 85. Not saying they're connected, it's just that that was kind of a a science fiction thought process that was going on. Yeah, so it's one of those sci-fi tropes that's kind of in the ether. Basically... The ship calls to him in the night, calls to David, and we move toward Act 3. Um, he says, get into the Ralph unit. Now, Ralph is a robotic meal delivery. I wrote it down. Robotic assistant labor facilitator. Right. So, so basically, it's a robotic slave. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's been just delivering meals, but it, yeah. because of that, we see... Also, not really in NASA in 1986. No, it's yeah. Like it's like the sliding Star Trek Yes, doors. exactly. And also that you could have had something like this controlled by remote, but this is like a self-driving car, right? right? And what's hilarious is this thing goes all over NASA property and nobody cares. Nobody cares. What's also interesting is I did have this part on the tape. I thought that Carolyn, Sarah Jessica Parker's character, I thought she helped him get out. And she really doesn't. She has been following around this robotic assistant as the intern, giving meals to people and mail and all of that kind of thing, delivering snacks to workers or whatever. So she didn't have as large of a role as I remembered. No, it seems more like Max is controlling Ralph. But I mean, in reality, Ralph basically looks like an airline drink beverage cart, Yeah. but made to look futuristic. I think that's likely what they used for the body of. And then, so... Okay, so the spaceship has been in the warehouse the whole time. And it's just like one smooth piece of like... Chrome chrome looking metal. Titanium looking stuff. And there's no way in and no way out. They can't figure out what it is or how it works or whatever. And then David touches it and the stairs come. Yes, and the stairs aren't connected. No, and it's so cool. And they so completely cool. defy gravity because you can step on it and it doesn't even, it's floating. Yes. Each step is floating, but even when he steps on it, it doesn't like sag or move. It's solid. The ship is completely shiny metal and very chromatic. And this is one of the very first movies that they utilize special effects to show reflection in chrome. Yes. And it's re- done really well. It's done very well. And also that part to me held yeah. up. Now there are a couple times where it looks kind of animated. There are a couple times where it looks maybe like today you would say was that green screened. Mm. But even that, there's there are other movies with CGI that do not look this good. I wouldn't complain if I saw this in a sci-fi no. show today. No, it was really cool. So then we have Paul Rubens doing a slower voice in the beginning Mm -hmm. for Max. Which is excellent. Which is excellent. And David gets in and we have a dialogue between them where the um, Max, the spaceship, which is short for like... Trimaxian. Trimaxian drone. Yes. So kind of like that it's never fully explained um but the implication is that the alien planet that they send out these drones to collect species from other worlds yes and so the drone is like an ai but not the alien itself right this is not the alien and it's not an alien piloting it it's more like an ai that this alien race has kind of created yes that's the implication yep um But I kind of like that it's not clear because, like, a lot of these kids' stuff, it doesn't matter. You don't need the info dumping, right? Right. You get, he says... The ship's cool. That's all that matters. It's just a cool ship. And he says, I've been collecting species, and then they go over and show them. I really liked here the puppetry work of the little species, but also of Max. It's like like a fancy dentist light. Yeah. Like on the arm that you can swing around. Well, it reminded me of that first cartoon from Pixar, with the hopping oh, yeah. lamp. Yep. But the way that they t- they move the light, it really, you do connect with it like a face. Like, yeah, it seems to move in an organic way. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And I love that then this chair comes, rises up out of the ground. And, and then the controls. Yep. And, and David sits into it. And Max says that you're the navigator. You're the one who has the maps in their mm-hmm. head. We have to do a data transfer. So... David's overwhelmed at first, and he just says, get me out of here. And 
Max says, where would you like to go? And he says, 20 miles away. Yes. And he shoots him 20 miles straight up into space. And then we have a little bit of anti-gravity where David floats. David just floats for a couple to, just seconds. for a second, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool effect, and it's kind of a funny joke. Um, and then we come back down, and then we kind of start this actual, which is the title, right? The Flight of the Navigator. Yes. So we start into that section. Um, for me... This is the weakest part of the movie. And part that I loved most as a kid. The NASA part or the flight of the Navigator? The flight. Part? Really? Because once he downloads everything from David's head, he starts... Max starts acting really goofy. Yeah, that's where it goes off the tracks for me. And... I'm like, dial back Paul Rubin. Just they, a little really bit. Really it is. Because they for, he it feels like really forced humor in a way that I just didn't... It was really kind of annoyed me a little. Trying too hard to be funny. To me, it felt like, as an adult watching this, it, I know Paul Rubens is doing the voice. It felt like Paul Rubens has two options. Serious, nice voice or Pee Wee Herman. And that's the only yeah. two characters he can do. Because it very much sounded like Pee Wee Herman. Yeah, and the part... That really, okay. There, because here's the thing: there are jokes here going up twenty miles. Right. That's a really good joke. Um, then we come to they're flying around and they go back and forth. Another good joke is they accidentally go left instead of right, and they end up in Tokyo. Right. <laughs> instead of Miami, <laughs> and um, and we get to see the skyline of Tokyo, and everybody tries to take a picture mm-hmm. of the spaceship. Um, they go into the ocean. <laughs> I mean, it's really it's kind of neat. It is is very visually. it is very visually really cool but we get back to florida finally where david's family is and where nasa is and we hit big al's gas station or big al's gator yep big al's gator gas so station this is supposed to be a little piece of americana like you would drive down the road and there would be these pla- well, there's, there still are some but not as many yeah and they would have a gas station but also like roadside attraction yep so they have like a little like Native American village. Yeah, you you see and, this still a lot on like Route sixty six. Yeah, and yeah. um and also in between South Carolina and North Carolina, mm-hmm. um south of the border, south of the border. Yeah. Yes, so like a roadside attraction. The guy who's the gas station attendant, Max goes, "Oh, that must be Big Al," and the joke really is that this guy is just standing there. Staring at it with his mouth hanging open. Yeah. And it's really funny. And and the kid goes up to him and is like, hey, can I have some money to call my house? Like, I need to f- call my parents. And then Paul Rubens basically, I think, my guess is that this was not scripted. Mm-hmm. And he says, hey, look, it's Big Al. Hey, Blimpo, oink, oink, too many Twinkies. It's just fat shaming him for no reason. Yeah. And... The, the actual joke comes later where there's this other family and they think that this is a roadside attraction. Yeah, they're like, they're like that Indian village isn't great, but this UFO is awesome. And then it flies away and Al goes, he just said he wanted to phone home. <laughs> it's so funny. But the fat shaming is in there and I really hated it because it was not funny. And I looked up um, this actor and his name is Rusty Pouch. And he works as a camera and electrical, typically. So that he probably did camera and electrical for this film. Okay. And then they... Um, pulled him in pulled as him an extra. In. But listen, he has worked on Moonlight, CSI Miami, The Sopranos, Dexter. Like, all of these amazing film and TV shows. And I did friend him on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> because he seems super nice. And I felt really... Ba- I mean, look, it seems like the guy's had a great life. And uh, that's my guess from seeing, you know, some of the stuff he's put out on into right. the internet. But I just... As a kid, this was hysterical to me. And as an adult, I was like, it's not, it's not funny. And it's mean. To be honest, as an adult, it's... Downside of the movie in this piece yeah. is, like I mentioned before, it's one of those examples of somebody needed to rope in Paul Rubens. Because the cool part and great part, even as a kid of this movie, is the alien spaceship thing. Yeah. And it, in the part where after they scan David's brain and he kind of picks up some of what it's saying is like human personality. Yeah. He basically becomes like a sibling 
And the two of them start fighting, calling each other names. Yeah. And you almost want to turn around and yell at the back seat. Like when you're an adult and you're like, stop yeah. fighting with each other. Yeah. And it, it was annoying. It wasn't funny. It wasn't impressive. Yeah. It would have been a way better movie if they kept the world tour part and yeah. looking for directions. But he stayed in the same alien mode that he'd been in earlier. I think so because I feel like you said the cool part is... Going up into space so quickly and then zooming across the Nebraska yes. prairies and then going and then they stop. They stop and there's a group of punks in a car listening to like punk rock synth music. Yes. And they ask them for directions and the punks suddenly become really wimpy and are like, drive away. You know, yeah. it's though there's natural comedy that comes out of this that it didn't need to be forced. Having said that, I don't know if that's adult eyes or if that's just 2022 eyes where. That's not the kind of humor we have anymore. Right. Humor is often very timely. And I can say that as a kid, I did think it was funny. As an adult, I don't. Um, but yeah, we have um, we have them zooming around. And then we kind of come toward the, the ending. Yeah, we come to the ending where they figure out how they find their way back to Fort Lauderdale. They're not sure exactly where David's new house is. Mm -hmm. But he had called home from Begal's, and Jeff, his little young, his little now older brother, goes up on the roof and fires off fireworks as a signal. So they're able to see that. Which, by the way, Jeff says, I don't know how I'll get you home, buddy. Maybe I'll set the house on fire. And we're like, don't do that, yeah. Jeff. Your family has already been through enough, Jeff. Yeah, don't but, don't light the neighborhood But he on fire, comes Jeff. up with this idea to do yeah. fireworks, which ties into the fact that David went missing on 4th of That's July. 4th of July, yep. And so... so they end up, he gets back, basically they, they fly up to the house and that's when he sees NASA's there already because they've been tracking it. The police are there, family is there, and it's obvious to him that, as he says to Max, you know, they're my family, but it's not my home. I don't belong here. I'm yeah. going to be studied like a lab rat my they're whole They're never going to leave me alone. Yeah, this is, a, my home is 1978. Yeah. And that's when, you know, they've dropped hints earlier in the movie that, normally Max would time travel the specimens back to where they were picked up. Right. But that they didn't think that he would be able to handle it and it wasn't a risk they wanted to take because it's made obvious that while Max picks up specimens and different in life forms from planets, brings them to be assessed at Phalon, they then return them back and leave them as they were. Right. So there's no, you know, they're not being tortured or anything of that nature. So David is zoomed back. To mm -hmm. 1978. They do like... Uh, yeah, they do make it look like it's a little dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, he zoomed back to 1978. He wakes up again in the ditch. And at first you're like, does he remember? Then he joins his family on a boat to look at the fireworks um, for 4th of July. And he says, I love you to his mom. And Jeff says, are you mad at me for like jumping and scaring him? And he says, no, Jeff, I love you too. <laughs> and then one of the little aliens crawls out of David's backpack and does a little hello. And um, it's at that point we realize not only does he remember, but this poor alien is never going to get back to its home or its time. And I hope that David keeps it safe because we don't want it studied under a microscope either. Right, right. But that's how it ends. It's a nice like family reunification and resetting of the timeline. Now, I would have loved to tag after the credits of older David at 20 going to get an internship at NASA so that he can fall in love with Carolyn <laughs> <laughs> because they had such good chemistry. Right. Um, not like flirting chemistry, just like on screen. Like they had good witty banter. Right, right. Um, and I would have loved that. We don't get that ending, we but that's don't. okay. It's but a family, that's all right. Yeah. It's a family film. So reception wise, the movie did fairly well. It cost $9 million to make. That okay. was the budget. It made eighteen point five million at the box office. So it did okay. So it doubled its money basically. Yeah. It was not a box office topper, only because it came out in nineteen eighty six. Yeah. Okay. Top Gun. Oh. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Howard the Duck. Right. Howard the um, Duck. Stand by Me. I love that movie. Uh, the Money Pit. The Karate Kid. These were all. Um, movies that came out in 1986. I want to revisit all those except Howard the Duck. Peggy Sue Got Married. Oh, yes. Um, Transformers the movie, which we talked, we talked about. about yeah. So, But it was not a flop. 
And it didn't lose money. There's also like this weird, you know, a lot of those movies you mentioned, I think of like Ferris Bueller as being a teen movie, but it really was marketed as like, same thing with Back to the Future. When I, <clears throat> we have watched Back to the Future yeah. together and it is, it, it was marketed as a family movie. It's not really a family. Right. It's, it's more really... of a, it's more of a teen 20s Adult, adult movie, yeah, yes. adult movie for older teens to yeah. adults. This is really a kids family movie. It is, yeah. And, and when it, you when you look at those movies, they're really not a lot of kids movies. Rotten Tomatoes gives it an eighty four percent. Okay, which is good. Yeah. Um, it had really good reviews from the L A Times, the New York Times, People Magazine, Variety. Um, all gave Flight of the Navigator good reviews. They were reviews that were like. You know, great effects, nice family mm. movie. And so it was, they were positive reviews. Yeah. I think that a lot of people our age have a good view of this movie. Like right. Like that, it's something they loved in their childhood that when they watch it, it doesn't ruin their mm. childhood. So how did you feel? So um, all in all, I mean, we we talked about it. There was some good jokes. The acting was really great. There was some, we mentioned the actors that were Such in it. There was act. some good actors. The special effects were phenomenal for its time. There was a lot of good things about the movie. The downside, like I said, that whole the whole section once they switched the AI to be like more antagonistic and tr- supposedly trying to make it more funny, I really it, I didn't like that part of the movie as much, and it was annoying to me. Yes. So um, all in all, I did get, I do have a pretty positive feeling of it. I am going to give Flight of the Navigator um, seven UFOs. Okay. Um, so I remembered that annoying part being a lot longer because I had never seen the first third of this okay. movie. And I really like it. I think I'm going to give it an eight. It is not, as Steve said, it's not perfect, but it, it does hold up pretty well. And I also, you know, we talk about whether kids would like it. I feel like maybe a kid would like this, but also like a teenager who likes things like Stranger Things Mm -hmm. and things like that. And I think it taps into that, especially because it's trying to contrast with 1978. It's bringing out some of the super 80s things in a way that other 80s movies don't acknowledge. So it's like, this is 80s culture. Right. New Wave punk music, Twisted Sister, Purple Hair. Um, eight, eight versions of Coke. MTV, like all of this kind of all of this kind of stuff. It yeah, it really speaks to the eighties to me and I really enjoyed it. So overall yeah. Seven and a a half half UFOs. UFOs. Seven and a half UFOs for Flight of the Navigator. So that kind of wraps up our discussion of Flight of the Navigator. Now, for my favorite part of the show. What is Steve willing to watch? Okay. So Gem is our next show. Gem is our next show. Just as a little tiny preview, because I don't think these descriptions make sense if you don't remember. Mm-hmm. Gem is about a, it's a cartoon. It's about a kind of a pop band. And I think that they have holograms as like secret <clears throat> identities. So the girl's real name is Jerrica, but she goes by Gem. Right. Then there's the Misfits who are their rival band. And they're more like punk, hard edge kind of, but I think still poppy. Yes. Okay. So we're going to watch the pilot to kind of establish how the holograms work. And then we're also going to, my choice was season one, episode three, Battle of the Bands. Okay. Because I just thought that sounded like a cool. It does sound cool. For for I'm assuming it's probably when the misfits really come in. Yeah. So here are your choices. Mm -hmm. Season two, episode three, The Scandal. Kimber faces humiliation when the misfits steal her diary and give it to a tabloid. <gasps> <laughs> Season 2, Episode 4, One Gem Too Many. When Gem has erratic behavior, the band stages an intervention to confront Jerrica. I don't know what kind of an intervention. Season 2, Episode 5, The Bands Break Up. The holograms and the misfits don't know what to do when Kimber and Stormer break up the bands and form a new duo. Number 4, Homeland Heartland. Jem travels to Yugoslavia to film a music video and to help dance better understand her mysterious past. Okay. Number 5, Season 3, Episode 7, Midsummer Night's Madness. Jem is caught in a love square with Rio and Riot when the holograms are scheduled to perform with the Stingers in Greece. Okay. So, 
we have uh, tabloid diary, intervention, bands breaking up, Yugoslavia, and what seems like maybe a twist on Midsummer Night Dream. Okay, how many am I choosing? Just one. Okay, let's go with the intervention. Okay. One gem too many. Yes. Gem is going to have an intervention and the, the band's going to confront Jerrica. Sounds good. Okay, so that is what is coming up next week. For this week, Flight of the Navigator, we gave it a seven and a half. You can find it on Disney Plus and you can probably rent it on Amazon Prime. As well, if you can, I'll link both of those on our Watch With Us blog. Yep. And until then, have a great week, everybody. My name's Megan. And I'm Steve. Bye. Bye.